evening, and welcome once again to Santa Cruz Christian Fellowship's Wednesday night Bible study. As the psalmist said, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So thank you for joining us this evening. Before we get into our study, I want to say this month, the month of February, is American Heart Health Month. And next Sunday, uh, the 14th, is Valentine's Day, that the day for lovers. But the best way that you can love yourself is by taking care of yourself. And each February, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is part of the National Institute of Health, uh, and the Heart Truth celebrate American Heart Health Month by motivating Americans to adopt healthy lifestyles to prevent heart disease. Focusing on your heart has never been more important, as their website says. People with poor cardiovascular health are also at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. And research shows that the more successful at meeting personal health goals, when we join forces with others, when we take care of our heart as part of our self-care, we set an example for those around us to do the same. Inspire and motivate yourself, the website says, and those you love to make heart health a regular part of your self-care routine. So many of us, as you see today, we were read during the month of February, and we focus on our heart. So I'm going to encourage you, uh, let's do those simple things like eating a better diet and, and exercising to help take care of our hearts because uh, we only get one in most cases. And if you do get a second one, it's a dangerous situation. So I'm going to encourage you. Let's take care of ourselves. Amen. Let's bow as we begin our lesson for this evening. Eternal God, our Father, how we thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, we thank you as we open your word. Thank you. You open our heart, our mind, our attitude. Lord, help us to set aside those events of this day, those events that may be on our schedule for this week, this month, for we truly only have this moment in time. So, Lord, thank you while we open your word. Thank you that you anoint us with your spirit. You are in the place where we are because you are a very present help in the time of need. So thank you for being our help, our strength, our teacher, and our guide this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our sixth lesson in our series entitled Comfort and Consolation in the Midst of Chaos and Calamity. We were looking at uh, Isaiah 40 through 48, which begins with a message of comfort. And it, as we read those, those, those chapters, Isaiah gives comfort and support, even though what's going around Israel at that time uh, was very chaotic. But the one thing we know about our God, he gives us peace. As his word says, thou will keep him, Isaiah 26 and 3 says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And we're focusing on how can we get things in order that we can maintain that perfect peace, that, that comfort and consolation in the midst of this chaos and calamity. Tonight's lesson is entitled very simply, Chosen by God. And it's from Isaiah 45. So open your Bibles there. There's going to be some scriptures on the screen, but there's some that I'm not going to, I haven't put on the screen, but we're going to read pieces of it. I just want to make sure that you have your Bibles there with you. So let's look at Isaiah 45. Look at verse 1. It begins, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I'm also including it uh, from another translation, from the New Living Translation. It, it, it says, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be opened, never to shut Again, now, when we look at Isaiah 45, this is a prophetic word 
directed at a particular person, Cyrus. And it was fulfilled, quite frankly, in Daniel chapter 5, uh, when Belshazzar was overthrown. And if you look at this verse, God announces by name the deliverer for his people from a coming captivity that they haven't even experienced yet. And he does it almost 200 years before it happens. See, his anointed means that Cyrus, as we see in verse 1 there, had a particular anointing from God for his work. God poured out his spirit on a pagan king because God wanted to use that man to bless and deliver his people. If, if you recall in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall, it says in verse 6 of chapter 5, then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against one another. I mean, that, that's like he's, he's, he's wobbly. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa what is this hand? This disembodied hand that's writing, mene, mene, tekel, you farcing on the wall, and he doesn't understand it. But, but, but notice what Isaiah says there from the New Living Translation. I like it. It says, before him, mighty kings, and if you look at Babylon, they, they were that head of gold that when we looked at last year when we studied the book of Daniel. It says, before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear, and this is what happened. Their fortress gates will be open, and we, find, we, we, we know from history that how was Babylon captured because the Medes and the Persians came in, but Babylon thought, we've got these thick walls. We, we're a mighty people. They're not going to do anything to us, and, but somebody left the gates open, and that's how they came through. But, but notice he says, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus his anointed. Now, we throw that word around a lot. Well, what does anointed mean? To be anointed is to be set apart, empowered, or protected. The act of anointing or being anointed is being smeared or rubbed with oil as part of a religious ceremony to make someone or something sacred. Notice how Cyrus is called his anointed one. What does that mean for Cyrus? But also, what does that mean for us? Because it's easy to look at this verse and just say, okay, that applied to Cyrus. It already happened. It's already done. Finished. I don't have anything to do with it. But there's, there's something deeper. See, there are different words used in Scripture for this same concept. The Messiah. We talk about Jesus being the Messiah. What does that mean? That means he is the anointed one. He's the chosen one. But other people, if when you look in Scripture, they are chosen. They are anointed. They are called for a particular purpose. We won't turn to it, but in Exodus 30, verse 26, it says, with it, talk about the anointing oil, and there was a special oil that was they had for anointing. It says, with it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony. In Exodus 36, verse 1, it says, But, but Beelzeel and the holy Abab, I hope I said that name right, and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has called has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to to all that the Lord has commanded. They were gifted artisans. They were called. They were, they were chosen. But, but, but let's look at it even further. Look, look at uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 1 through 3. I, I skipped verse 2, but, but we're going to read it. It says, now the Lord said to Samuel, now God had rejected Saul from being king. And he told Samuel, notice what it says. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go and I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, 
for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And verse 2 is not on the screen, but verse 2 says, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And notice verse 3, it says, Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall, ready, anoint for me the one I name to you. That, that, that's a, anointing an individual. The, the king, David, was specifically chosen by God. Why? Because he had rejected Saul because of Saul's disobedience and his obstinance. Look, look at Acts 10.38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. This anointing of Jesus occurred, we see in Matthew 3, at his baptism, when the Spirit of God descended on Jesus in the form of the dove, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God anointed him for service. And when you look after he was anointed for service, he went to the wilderness. But then in, in Luke 4, we show him, see him beginning his ministry where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. We see that uh, quoting Acts 60, uh, 61. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.12. It says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us to God. Every Christian, ready? Every Christian is anointed for something. When you get born again, stay with me now. When you get born again, when you receive Jesus, God's spirit, as 1 Corinthians says, baptizes you in the body of Christ, you are anointed, you are in the body of Christ. And when he does it, he calls you for a purpose. Because no Christian is called to save, is, is called to be saved and then to sit. No, you get saved, but then you have a work to do. And notice what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Peter says this, but you are a chosen generation. You are an anointed generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Remember what it's, we said about anointing. It was choosing you out, someone or something for something. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But there's even further. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This is when Ananias got a message from God to say, I need you to go lay your hands on Saul that he may receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias was like, ho, 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 ho. Time out, God. Time out. Time out. Saul. Saul of Tarsus. The one who killing Christians. You, you, you want me to go see Saul? Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you sure? But notice what it says in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel. He's anointed of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake. See, Saul was chosen. He became Paul the apostle. Why? Because he was chosen to be a light to the Gentiles. But look at, go back to Isaiah chapter 45. Look at the assignment. See, Cyrus has an assignment. Notice his assignment there in verse 1. He's to subdue nations, loose the armor of kings, or, or as the New Living Translation says, paralyze, get those paralyzed with fear, open double doors, those fortress gates, and prevent the gates from shutting. In other words, he's going to get rid of Babylon for good. Cyrus had an assignment. But we also have an assignment. 
Why? Because when God anoints us, it's for a purpose. Because look how Cyrus fulfilled his purpose. Look at Ezra chapter 1. Scripture records, now remember, this is almost 200 years after Isaiah had delivered his prophecy. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of the king of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. See, th th this is the biblical fulfillment of what Cyrus was anointed to do, what Isaiah called him by name, but also what Jeremiah said in, in his prophetic word, because Jeremiah said Israel was going to go through 70 years of captivity. Even though those false prophets were saying, oh, we're going to be, we never going to be destroyed. God got, got, God got our back. It, no, no. Jeremiah said, we're going to go through 70 years. And when it happened, they're going to say, oh, we, you know, God's going to deliver us real soon. Jeremiah said, no, y'all need to plant some vineyards. Y'all need to go buy a house. Y'all need to settle down because we're going to be in this for 70 years. This, this is not going to be some quick deliverance. This is going to be a long time coming. And what Cyrus did to Babylon to help free Israel, it's recorded here in Ezra 1. It's also recorded in 2 Chronicles 36. And the amazing thing is that God used an ungodly king who was no part of the covenant blessing of Israel. But he used somebody ungodly to do his work. What can he do with somebody who's in the family? Who, who's connected with God? No, notice what it says in Matthew 10, starting at verse 5. It, it says, these 12, the 12 disciples, Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Jesus sent those 12 men out with an assignment. He told them where to go, and where not to go. Go into the city, but don't go the way of the Gentiles. And he also told them, what were they to do when they got there? He said, preach, heal, cleanse, raise the dead, cast out demons. That was it. The passage goes on to, ver to, to, to verse 10. It's not included there, but they were not to receive an offering. They were not to, to start the 12 disciples, the evangelist association of Nazareth, Israel, to make a name for themselves. They, they weren't to talk about overthrowing Rome. No, no, that was not part of their ministry. They were to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look, look, at, look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees this great scene in heaven. As it starts off at Isaiah 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And when you get down to verse 8, he says, Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and their eyes shut, 
lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. See, Isaiah had a calling and an assignment. We get in big time trouble when we don't know our assignment. God equips you for an assignment and only for that assignment. We mess up when we don't know where our box is. See, I need to stay out of other people's box because I'm not anointed to be there. But I got to know where God has placed me, how God has gifted me, how God has given me a passion. See, I'm not a dancer. I have no business being on the dance team, but my wife is. She loves it. She enjoys it. Even though she's a teacher by profession. Teaching Bible study, is it, that's not where her anointing lies. See, I'm not the sound person. I thank God for Brother Jason. He runs it. He know what to do. Right? If I go back there on the board, you'd be seeing a black screen, or most of the times, y'all would, we wouldn't even have Bible study because I was like, oh, Lord, what button did I punch? And I punched the wrong one. See, wh- where is my box? My box. God has called me and gifted me to teach his word. I enjoy, I en- I enjoy the study part As much as I love, matter of fact, I think I enjoy the study part more than I enjoy the delivery part. But see, if that comes hard for you or, 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 or if you are petrified to stand before a group of people, what does that mean? God hadn't called you to do that. Why? Because you're not anointed in that area. If you're anointed to sing, you sing to the glory of God. But what else you do? Sometimes you 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 will just in your room and you start singing, and folks don't don't realize you don't realize that you're doing it. Why? Because that's your passion. That's how you gift it. When you minister to people, it's not showy. You because you've seen some folks. The, the song is more about them then it's about giving God praise and glory. When you get through, you know, after, after they done showed out and got the microphone and fall out, out and, you know, it's like, boy, go sit down. Because cause you, you, that's in the flesh. That's not in the spirit. So Cyrus had an assignment. You and I have an assignment. But the best thing about the assignment is that we have, ready, some foundational support. It can be scary when we are out there doing a job. But but Isaiah gives support to Cyrus, who doesn't even know he needs it. Because notice what he says in verse 2 and 3. He says, I will go before you to make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. Notice how many times in these two verses He says, I will. I will go before you. I will break in pieces. I will give you the treasure. God is using Cyrus, but the power behind the throne that Cyrus is on is the God who prophesied what he would do. See, we we, we like to quote, Philippians 4.13, 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The word says that. We are just the instrument. But God is the strength. Don't misuse that verse, though. If God has not called us for that assignment, he has not strengthened us to do it. Why? Because I can't do it under my own power. I can go out and say, oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I'm going to start a church. Greater Santa Cruz Christian Fellowship number two. I'm going to start it out. And I will tell you exactly what will happen. Ready? It will flop. Why? Because God had not called me for that. Too many times we do something, we think it's spiritual. Oh, I'm going to do this for God. God didn't call you to do that. He placed you in a, in, a, in a particular place for a particular purpose. Think about how King David wanted to build a temple for God, and he went to Nathan, and Nathan said, Hey, sounds good to me. Let, 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 let's go build it. Let's get up the plans. Let's. But God had to come to the prophet Nathan in a vision and said, you go back and tell David, he's a man of war, and I don't want him building this temple, but his son Solomon will do it. David could have said, I am going to build this temple, for, you know, because I'm the king. I don't know. No. He wasn't anointed. Far too many times we get individuals who have a desire. Much like Paul, when he wanted to go to the east and there was a vision he had in Acts 16, a vision that, said that, 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 that came to him and said, come over to Macedonia and help us. In other words, I, Paul wanted to go east. He wanted to go to Asia. And, and that vision says, no, go over to Macedonia, which was the other way. Why? Because God was taking the gospel to this end of the world. Well, you say, well, everybody needs to hear the, hear the gospel. Yeah, everybody needs to hear it. But Paul wasn't called to go there. He wasn't anointed to go there. That foundational support he needed would not be there if he went to Asia. Because see, look, verses 3 through, through 9, really, Isaiah kind of goes on a back and forth of God versus the Lord. God of gods versus these other gods. God is differentiating between who he is and the other gods that the people may believe in. Remember last week's lesson? We looked at Isaiah 44 about those other gods. The, 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 does God have competitors? Yeah, he has competitors, but they're not God. Mark and note in these verses how God refers to himself. Look, look at Isaiah 45 verse 3. He says, I am the God of Israel. Verse 5, he says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. The latter part of verse 6 says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Verse 11 says, the Holy One of Israel and his maker. The C portion of verse 14 says, and there is no other. There is no other God. Verse 21 says, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. What is God doing? God is proclaiming his sovereignty. He's the supreme, ultimate authority. What does it mean that God is sovereign? The fact 
One dictionary definition said the fact that God is sovereign essentially means that he has the power, wisdom, and authority to do anything he chooses within his creation. Whether or not he actually exerts that level of control in any given circumstance is actuality a completely different question. He, he has the power, wisdom, and authority to do anything he chooses within his creation. And how many of you, we may not want to admit it, how many of us don't like sometimes what God has done? How many of us have prayed for somebody to be healed only to see them die? How many of us have believed God and our prayer wasn't quote unquote answered the way we want it. And you think back, ready? Sometimes God is sovereign. As one songwriter said, he can do whatever he wants to, when he wants to, and how he wants to. But we could take comfort in his sovereignty. Because notice what it says in verse 18 of Isaiah 45. It says, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. This is God's resume. He created the heavens. He formed the earth. And he did it for a purpose. It was not in vain. Oftentimes, I, I know, I know, we have to question why. But God, in his sovereignty, does not explain to us oftentimes the details. But he lets us know as the end of verse 18 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. And I know how it is sometimes. We, we, we like to, well, this is the reason this, ha no, no. We, we want to be sometimes like, like, like the Pharisees in John 9 when the man was, well, well, the disciples, when they asked Jesus in John 9, who sinned that this man was born blind? Somebody did something wrong. And, and Jesus said, nobody. The man didn't say, well, first place, the man couldn't sin because he's a baby. He's born blind. You can't sin in the womb. And Jesus said, his parents didn't either. But God had a purpose for it. Look, look, at, verse, look at verse 22 and 23 of Isaiah 45. He says, look to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He says, ready, I have sworn by myself. See, God can't say, I swear to God, because I'm God. But Isaiah says, I, I've, I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and it shall not return. See, if you recall at the end of the verse, he says, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take. And oh, some of you good Bible people already know that the Apostle Paul used this verse in Isaiah 45, 23. As the basis for saying in Philippians 2, as it says at the beginning at verse 9, therefore God, speaking of uh, Jesus, there Paul speaking of Jesus, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what's going to happen? Every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There will come a time that every person will have to acknowledge 
God's superiority and his sovereignty. And it's not a question of if, because it says every knee shall bow. Whether you're Christian or non-Christian. Whether you believe right now or don't believe. Because it's not a question of if every knee shall bow. But when are you going to bow? It's smart to bow now while you have the opportunity and the chance and the ability to make that choice. Because when you do it at the end, when the choice is, you don't have a choice. But you're going to have to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. So here's my next question. Ready? Why do I continue to ask, can God use me? Because here's an answer. Ready? Self-esteem. It isn't how other people see you. It's how you see yourself. And that's what makes it hard. Sometimes we can't see ourselves. Being used by God. Last, last year, for my preaching on, on Second Sunday, we talked about vision. And in that first message back in January, gave the illustration of Walt Disney. He went to Florida and saw a big piece of swampland. And all it was was swampland. Several miles of swampland. Everybody else saw swamp. But Walt Disney saw Disney World. And he laid the foundation for Disney World. Before he died in 1966, because Disney World wasn't open until 1971. Over four years after Walt had died. Why? He saw himself. Sometimes we have to see ourselves and not resist what God's trying to do. No, no, go, go back to Isaiah 45. Look at verse 9. It says, Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? I, think about it. I know we, we here in America like to say, I have my rights. I got my First Amendment right. I got my Second Amendment right. I got my Third Amendment. I got my rights. You're not going to tell me what to do. And God, like you're going to tell God, how come you did this to me? We are the clay, and we don't get to say to he who forms it, what you think you make it? Or ask your parents, what are you begetting? I should have some say in this. You ain't got no say. The created thing doesn't have any control or authority over the creator. Notice what it says in Isaiah 29. It says, surely... 
Isaiah said, you, you, you turn things around. Shall the potter be esteemed as much as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he didn't make me? Or shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding? Notice how dumb that sounds. The thing made doesn't get to say, no, he didn't do it. You know, you think about it. I work in downtown L.A. Downtown L.A., there is the Disney Concert Hall that was designed by Frank Gehry. And, and outside, it's like, ooh, it's kind of strange looking. It's silver, and it's, it, it's not like a normal building. It, it has this great design on it. Inside, it, it's, it's the concert hall, and there's an there's a, a, a open area there that you can have parties and receptions. I was at a reception there one time. I said, oh, man, it's, it's not, the acoustics in there are wonderful. But guess what? Frank Geary did not put one nail or one piece of steel. What did he do? He had it in his mind. He designed it, and he let somebody else do it. And the other person can't say, well, why are you doing it this way? No, your job is to form that metal. It, your job is to do what the designer, what the creator said to do. And that's really our essential role. Can God use me? Okay, God, I'm Cornell Winston. I'm reporting for service. Because notice what it says in Jeremiah 18, verse 6. O house of Israel, can I not look, do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the hands of the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Why? The potter gets to form the clay however he wants. If he wants to make it into a water pitcher, he could do that. If he wants to make it into a slop jar, he could do that. And you can't say, well, I can't believe you made me like that. Why? Because it's the creator's choice. See, part of our problem is we can't see ourselves. So what do we use? We use words, words like impossible, undesirable, unable. Oh, that's impossible to do. Oh, that's, a, ooh, that's an undesirable thing. I don't, that, that, no. Oh, I'm unable to do that. I'm, I'm. Take away the negative. Impossible can become possible. Undesirable can become desirable. Unable can be turned into able. So how are we going to change my no to a yes? You know what? The first thing is, ready? If God calls you, he qualifies you. But make sure he's the one that called you. Don't try to do the job because grandma calls you or you're trying to compete with somebody else. Or, or because you, you say, well, I come from a line. I know an individual, he says, well, my dad was a preacher and his dad was a preacher and his dad was a preacher. So I guess... I got to be a preacher too. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you called yourself because your daddy, your granddaddy, your great-granddaddy was, you, you may think you have the gift of preaching, but we don't have the gift of listening. See, make sure it's God who called you and not you. Not because you think it's fun. I know far too many people, I've spoken to far too many people. Oh, God called me. God called me. And God didn't call me. And when you have to do the work, you got tired in the work. You got frustrated in the work. And you quit. Why? Because, ready? God didn't call. You get upset over people. They're they, they not listening. They're not anointed. No, no, it's not like.
like they're not anointed to listen. You wasn't anointed to speak it. So if God calls you, he qualifies you. But if he calls you, secondly, yield yourself to be used of God. You have to be like Isaiah and say, here am I, send me. Because if you, if you look in the book of Acts, when they were calling individuals for service, the scripture says there were a whole bunch of people, I believe it's in Acts 13, that, that were available. And the Holy Spirit says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have for them. Why? Because there were six other people there, but God hadn't called them. He needed Barnabas and Saul. He didn't need Niger or Lucius or, or, or any other, other individual. They were available. But Paul and Barnabas had to yield themselves to be used of God. When he does use you, stay humble. God can't use a person with a big head. I, I, I've seen people, God start to use them, and all of a sudden, they become untouchable. They, 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 I carry my own Bible. Why? Because in my Bible, I, 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 I'm not so anointed that I have to hand my Bible off to somebody as I walk through because I have my five armor bearers that keep me from the people so this wonderful anointing doesn't get displaced out. No, no, dude, you ain't, you, no, stay humble. You put your pants on one leg at a time. Recognize it's not you, but the Christ that's in you. People see you because you're tangible. You're in the flesh. But always know that it's not you, but the Christ that's in you. I'm a spokesperson. Which means, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents his country in a foreign country. We're strangers in this pilgrim journey. We represent heaven. We represent Jesus Christ wherever we go. When I'm ugly toward the checker in the grocery store, that not only is a reflection on me, it's a reflection on the God who I serve. When we get back to service and the people on the parking lot trying to tell you, please park here and you act ugly as you coming into church. That's a reflection not only on you, but it's a reflection of the God who you serve. Recognize it's not you, but the Christ that's in you. And when you do that, you could give him the glory. People will say, pat you on the back. Oh, you just blessed me. Well, you know what? Praise God. Thank you. You know what? I know y'all. I, I appreciate your words of encouragement, your kindness. I appreciate how you write in the chat. I, I go back and look at Bible study on, on YouTube and Facebook and the chat, and sometimes I get to answer back. And I, I appreciate it. But you know what? I give God the glory because if he didn't help me, I couldn't put two sentences together. I'd come up here, and y'all would turn and say, ooh, well, that was a waste of an hour. No, no, no. I give God the glory because 
All glory belongs to him. I'll say thank you for your kind words. I do. I thank you. I thank you every time you tune in. I think every time you take notes and you, you say, oh, I've said something that, that's blessed you, that helped you in your spiritual walk. Because that's what I pray for every time we start Bible study, even when I'm preparing. That, that, that's my prayer. God, let, let, let something be said. Let, 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 me, let me study right. Let, let me have some good illustrations. Let me focus. Why? Because I want you to go. But, but, but I can't say, ooh, didn't I? I? I taught that lesson today. Can't nobody teach better. Than, no, no. I'm going to say, God, thank you for anointing me, for choosing me. I ran from it. My wife will tell you, I ran from it. And when I finally say yes, her response was, I was wondering what took you so long. But when you fall in and you know what God chose you to do, how he equips you, you'll be blessed. People around you will be blessed, and God will be glorified. I'm going to stop there. Next week, next week's lesson, Isaiah 46 is a very short chapter, only those 13 verses, but it's going to ask the question, who is God? And we're going to answer that question next week. So I look forward to having you join us. As we always say, if you like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, please, please email me. Uh, cornell.h.winston at gmail.com. I know there's a lot of scriptures, and sometimes you can't write them down fast enough, or you, my PowerPoint, I, I send along so you can have it. Also, some have asked, and I'll say it again, I, I'll, I'll make this monthly uh, announcement to say, you're invited to participate in our offering. You don't have to be a member of Santa Cruz Christian Fellowship, but if you wanted to send an offering, to Santa Cruz Christian Fellowship, you could send it to P.O. Box 800215, Santa Cruz, California, 91380. Giving is also available through Zelle, PayPass, Venmo, Cash App, or you could go to our website, myscf.com. There's a donate button there. But I would tell you, there's no pressure. Freely, as we read earlier, freely we have received. Freely we're going to give. As God grants us his grace and opportunity. We'll come for it every, every Wednesday with Bible study. I am just glad that you tune in, you tell others about Bible study, and you're growing in the Lord. That is my one goal and my one aim. So again, God bless you. Uh, be sure not only to join us online every Wednesday as, as you're doing so, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whenever you can access this, because it stays up there so yeah, it's Wednesday night Bible study, but you may not get it until Friday night. Whenever you get it, it's always good. God's word is always fresh. So you're invited to join in with us. This Sunday, February 14th, is Valentine's Day. So make sure you, you've got, you've got uh, three days to go find your cards. If you have a love interest, you've got some time. Uh, don't, don't wait till Saturday night. When everything's closed and everything's picked over, uh, make sure we, 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 Sunday is love Sunday. Don't let Monday be anger Monday. So we're going to take care of those little things if you, have a, if you have a love person in your life. Amen. So, again, God bless you. God keep you. Thank you for joining in again with us tonight. Let's bow and we'll conclude. God, our Father, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you choose us for a purpose. Lord, you've called us to declare your name. you called us to be an ambassador for Christ. God, you chose us. You equipped us. You sent us out, Lord, to represent you. So help us, Lord, to be a true, accurate representation of you in our lives. Lord, we thank you for each and every individual that's tuned in. Lord, return this, this time back to them again with a better life. Lord, a life that's in pleasing service. Lord, that in the midst of chaos and calamity that we see all around us, Lord, thank you 
There's comfort. There's consolation. There's peace. Not because anything we have done, but Lord, thank you that you keep us in perfect peace. Lord, we thank you. As you spoke to the wind and said, peace be still, Lord, you thank you. You speak to that anxiety in our hearts and tell us the same thing, be still. So we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this privilege of opening your word, of declaring your word. As we conclude, Lord, keep us in your care the remainder of this week. Allow us the privilege to join in on Sunday or uh, next Wednesday, whenever we get the chance and opportunity. That even while we're distancing socially because of COVID, we are never distant from you. Thank you, God. You continue to be a very present help. We love you, we bless you, and we thank you. Be with this church. Help us to continue to lift high your name, to draw men and women unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God keep you. Look forward to seeing you again next week.